I have uh, Roberta Beery here, and we're doing a sidebar interview on something we're both passionate about, and that's hybrid. How do you write them? What's involved? What are the what makes each of the components of it work? And I'm going to turn the floor over to Roberta because uh, she has written <laughs> some of the best hybrid. I she's the one who's inspired me to write been actually <laughs> uh, and uh because i read her work and there's such a variety in it that i think she's got something to say about this about the topic so roberta take the floor okay thanks thanks mike um as some of you may know i've been the hyben editor at uh, modern haiku for at least the past six years, I think maybe seven. And so I do see a lot of high bun. I also write a lot of high bun. By a lot, I mean, um, uh, I think I have about um, 100 that I consider of my own work to be good quality high bun. There, I'm not counting any of the other stuff that I don't consider, but I, I like to give you <clears throat> the benefit of my many years of experience, which is, I think I've been writing Hyben since the early 2000. Yeah, maybe it was 2000 was my first one. And for a long time, I didn't send any of them anywhere because I just didn't have the belief that they were publishable. And once you've been doing something, I think for more than 10 years, no matter what it is, you get somewhat good at it just by perseverance. So now it's very easy for me. Well, not very easy, but it's pretty easy for me to spot um, high bun that I consider to be publishable and high bun that I don't. And that goes for my own work as well. Uh, for me, there's three main ingredients in the haiku recipe, the title, the prose, and the haiku. And there can be more than one haiku. No hard and fast rules. But um, <clears throat> I'd have to say I have never taken a high, high bun where there's been a sort of substandard haiku involved in the piece. I will sometimes work with um, a poet and try to get that hyben to match the quality of the title and the and the prose, but it doesn't always work. I mean, I'll say, send me some more, you know, if you like, get back to me. I didn't feel this this haiku exactly worked. I usually say something like it needs to be stronger for me, or I think it's not as strong as the rest of the hyben. And sometimes what I'll what will happen will I'll get a let's say somebody sends me five haiku, and plus I'm still thinking about the original one that was in the piece. And that once or twice I've just suggested an edit combining like the line one of one haiku and line two of the other haiku or line two and three. And that somehow resonates so much more with the piece and is a better haiku. And I think the poet had it in her or himself or their self all the time you know, on some sub subconscious level, because it's their words, not my words. And um, it's just, they didn't dig deep enough. And that's one of my comments that I sometimes give people who ask, if you ask the editor, you know, for a comment, I will give a comment, but if you don't, I won't, because I get too many of them. And when, and I've had people come back to me and say, what do you mean by dig deeper, which is, uh, tells you something about the poet and something about me. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm being too obvious <laughs> with my comments and then <clears throat> somebody will come back to me and say, what do you mean by this? So uh, for me, dig deeper means going to the heart of what you're trying to say. You have something important to say in your high bun, otherwise you wouldn't be writing it and you wouldn't want to see it published. You might not know that, but I, as an editor, can see it. Uh, usually the writer does know it. Um, so dig deeper means don't stand on the periphery and think by some 
osmosis the reader is going to get where you're trying to go. That's different from on the nose writing. You don't want to tell everything. You know, you don't want to have the title repeat what the prose says, and then the haiku is like a little synopsis of the of the prose. I mean, that that's not what a haibun is. Uh, but on the other hand, you want to take risks in your writing. The best haibun that I've find, found of my own and other people's are where the writer takes risks. And what I mean by that is, I mean, part of you should, it should, you know, not be painful, but not be completely easy. So digging deeper and taking risks, though, those often go hand in hand. <clears throat> The high, you can do a lot with Hyben, you can do time shifts, you can do a, a memory of childhood, and then by the haiku, indicate that the adult is looking back. You can um, have a title that has certain uh, political overtones where it's not a political poem, but yet <clears throat> it speaks to the zeitgeist of the moment of what you're reading in the paper or seeing on TV. Uh, I'm not a big fan of political motifs because I don't think that that's the right venue. Other Hyben editors feel differently, you know, so there's, there's, it's all a matter of um, personal preference. I don't want, you know, modern haiku Hyben to be a sounding board for some political yeah. point of view. And I, I'm, that's kind of turns me off when I read those things. I also am not very interested in personal vendettas. <laughs> and you, you'll be surprised how many of those I get where a thinly disguised, um, uh, this person did me wrong somehow. And now even though it's, they've been dead for 20 years or it's 25 years later, I'm gonna get back at them in a mean way that's different from uh, some event that happened to you that was harmful caused by another person that speaks to you in the hive and it's two completely different things because the event that speaks to you that was harmful can be a universal event that appeals and is accessible to a variety of readers around the world. Whereas a personal vendetta is just between you and the other person who may or may not even know that you know you're harboring these feelings. So there's a lot um, of room in a hyphen to express oneself, and I know that um, people who write prose poems kind of have a segue into hyphen. They think if they've been a successful prose poem poet, but they a lot of them don't have much experience with haiku. Right. So. Um, there's one poet whose name I won't mention, but she's a very well-known lyric poet. And I worked with her for, I'd say more than a year on and off. She would send things in before getting to what I considered something that modern haiku would be happy to publish. And it was always the haiku. I mean, there were either sentences or just like a statement of fact, repeating something that was in the prose repeating the title by, and then adding two lines, I could go on and on. I mean, it wasn't just this particular poet, but it's the kind of thing you see. And you'll also see more experienced haiku poets um, do this. I, some of whom write quite good haibun when they want to put the effort in, but they don't always want to put the effort in. Another thing I'm not a big fan of, and I'm very, my own heart criticisms are reserved for myself, or lazy write is lazy writing. Yeah. Um, that will, when I see somebody like ask a series of questions in the prose of the haibun, that to me does, that's, you know, not really putting a lot of effort into the, into the, into the prose part. So I'd say one or two questions are okay. Um, like if you have a story and you want to move it forward, or if you want to take a break, uh, and have a you know natural pause there for the reader, but you know be be a, a hard taskmaster for yourself when you're writing Hyben. That's the sort of the best advice I can give. And also, uh, as far as breaks go, 
if you feel you need to take a break as a reader, that means I think that your high bun is too long. And some high bun, you'll, you'll see they'll go on for pages and pages and pages. I don't know if it's the current overstimulation through the um, internet and the, you know, the media and 24 seven, you know, on and on to events, but people's attention span to me seems to be getting smaller and smaller and you don't want to lose the reader. You know, you don't want the reader to just read the first couple of sentences or one sentence and then just go off somewhere and close it and say, what's, what was the, why do people say this is a good high one? Uh, so to me, the, the title will draw the reader in. So saying something Thing like let's say my one of my early ones was called Sunday Visit. Now I would never call one of my own hive and Sunday Visit again, but um, <clears throat> at the time I didn't really know any better. You can think of all sorts of interesting titles that bring the reader in and say, "I'm going to out of all the hive in this book or in this anthology or in this journal, I'm going to stick with this one or I'm going to read this one first. And then equally important is the first sentence because that's another place where you'll lose readers. I, so I if I know, could say something in the title, I think yeah. people underestimate that. Uh, and I, I think the one of the, uh, the example I give people a lot is one by Michelle Ruth Bernstein. You happen to judge that contest, <clears> but it's, it's still one of my favorite hyphen. And the title was two words, say summer. And oh, I love that one. Yeah. It, Yay, it, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, she's great, by the way. Uh, she's my haiku teacher, so you got to pity her. She's trying to teach me haiku. Uh, the, uh, but that, that was those two words. You're basically giving the reader a command. Say summer. And when you say a word, everything that's associated with, with the word comes in. And then she tells her story. And then she caps it. With, with a, uh, a haiku. Yeah, just an amazing stunning. haiku, right. And <clears throat> that's, so people underestimate the value of it. And I, I, I now that, then there's some people now saying, well, you don't need a title. Uh, technically they may have a point. Uh, Basho didn't necessarily title this hyphen, but uh, you know what? In English uh, haiku, that title is a very important thing. So I, I spend as much time on that as I would on the prose or the-, or the Yeah, me too. And also um, I have to say, I think modern haiku under my um, Haibun whatever editorship has taken one or two without a title. It's very rare. Yeah. It has to be quite an exceptional Haibun. And the, the one that I'm thinking of was quite an exceptional high, but I think it was last year or something. And I think I'm pretty sure it was nominated for a, um, a push cart. Um, and to, to, so I talk about the Holy Trinity of high, but the title prose and haiku. And, you know, there's an essay, people, if they're interested, I can send them or it's, it's available online with that title. I think it was first um, published in the British Haiku Society's Blythe Spirit, but it's also in a few other places now. And uh, I talk in that essay about how all the three parts work together and how also they should be able to stand on their own. In other words, the title shouldn't be weak enough that it only has meaning by reading the prose and the haiku should be able to be a standalone haiku that you could send to any contest. I mean, that's what I judge for myself as a standard, not that the haiku only makes sense when you read the prose. It, it should be a quality enough, strong enough, high enough quality that it, it evokes a feeling that's in the prose and the, and the title and they all somehow link together, but the link is not obvious, the reader works. The reader has to do some work. When everything's set out, um, it's 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 doing a disservice to the reader when you write a high bun that way. Um, another, besides digging deeper and taking risks, another comment I'll, uh, I often, well, sometimes make is drop the last two lines of the prose or the last line of the prose. For some reason, 
Hyben writers feel they have to tie everything up in a little bow at the end of the prose. And you'll often find those same people, the same writers, then just in case you didn't get what I'm saying, <laughs> I'm gonna put in the haiku too. And um, by the way, the title also says it in, in, a, in another way. So uh, I like open endings in my own work and in other people's work. I don't wanna be told this, this, this happened. You know, I want, I want sort, sort of more of a feeling to be evoked. And then you can think, did this happen or did this happen? Probably this happened, but I'm not sure, you know? And, you know, the same as the ending of a good novel. There was not always a happy ending, but a lot of times you don't know what, what's, what's, what are the characters gonna do? Well, um, I think there's technique too, uh, in, the, in the prose particularly, what you said about the trying to put too much in is, that's that's absolutely me. But the the one of yours that I use when I talk to people about Hyvin, I put it up on the screen, and I think you wrote it in I think two thousand five, and you used three things: uppercase, lowercase, spaces. Not a single punctuation. No. You remember the stream of consciousness? Yeah. Would you say? Yeah. It, but it was, but that was so freeing for me when I saw it. I, I use that as an example. I said, sometimes you, you got to see somebody else take a risk before you're willing. Oh, okay. And which was that one? Because I've written a few like that. Uh, 2005, I think it won an award in Modern Haiku. It, it was, it was selected. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Because I, I have written a series of, um, One's about um, priests I do, <laughs> having gone to Catholic school early on before um, I knew about uh, psychiatry and therapy and that kind of thing. <laughs> so there were certain things just embedded in my psyche and um, <clears throat> those early uh, experiences, you know, in the confessional and that kind of thing. And I've also written um, one early Hyben I wrote was about my father's memory that he spoke of a lot when I was growing up and also on his deathbed. And it was about um, his father putting him on his shoulders and taking him to the local bar with a bucket. His father would hold a bucket. So we're talking early 1900s now. And the man, the bartender would fill up the bucket so the first, the prose is um, something like high on my father's shoulders. I was into the bar. We went the barman calling beer here, beer here. Can you imagine that five cents for all that beer? Blah, 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 you know, and then goes on my father and I laughing all the way home. And then the haiku is something like um, uh, so, something visit, hospital visit or home visit scent of mothballs in the open drawer or something like yeah. that so that you know now you're but so many people didn't get that th that was my father's voice in the prose and my <laughs> voice in the haiku I thought I was being overly obvious um there's also one I wrote uh, wow. uh around that time Pity, pity the daughters of beautiful mothers. Uh, the years spent growing into a beauty that never comes. The sympathetic looks finally understood at the moment when childhood ends. Mothers visit side by side, we outline our lips. And I think that was first untitled and then I, it was republished a few times and I finally titled it Lipstick. But People said to me, I mean, I was not a pretty kid. I was not there. I had a beautiful older sister and I had a beautiful mother and people would just come up to me in that way that nothing they would never do today. You know, and I was like five years old walking with my mother holding her hand and my sister was next. What happened to you? The, you know, the genes didn't work or something. I mean, I was a little kid, you know, I took all that in. Plus, I was a bit of a roly poly, more than a bit. And one of my nicknames was Butterball. So that should, those things stay with you when you're little, you know? Yeah, it's, but, but that's, yeah. But it's, it's all grist for the high bun mill. There is a positive here. 
And, you know, I like to think that it made me more empathetic to people um, and less judgmental, which is something I, I struggle with having grown up in, you know, the, the super critical kind of uh, family that were popular in the 60s. Yeah. So. Hey, you know, we, we, we all have that. That's the, the, the other thing that comes out in Hyben is it's, it's, it's not you. It's the you other people have of you. You know, it's, it's, it's their, their right. vision of you that comes out a lot of times. And, you, and it's, a, it's a conflict we all deal with because uh, uh, just as, as individuals is that other people see you and they, they formed an opinion about you that is not you. It's clearly not you, but well, right. It's not, and it's not a lot of my high is not strictly autobiographical either. I mean, I'll take something that happened to somebody or I overheard something on a train or a bus and I'll make that into, I consider an authentic high yeah. You know, I do not believe that haiku high has to be biography. I'm, I'm very, were you talking earlier about what do I feel passionate about? That's one of the things I feel passionate about because I have had people email me and say, I, I was there, this didn't happen. Or, you know, people in my own family. <laughs> I mean, it's just a composite of different people I've known over the years. Even if I say my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, that could be anybody's brother, sister, mother, father, just one I made up you know, and just a conglomeration of, of or as they say, uh, uh, conflating, to use a word of the zeitgeist today. Well, and so you, you hit it too. It's observations of other people and, and snippets of conversations and things that have happened that you're observing. They, they all affect you. Everything that happens in your life is, is part of you. So in that sense, it is. It's coming out of you. Because it, it can't got went into you uh, through through some other person's experience too. A lot of times it's it's something somebody else has has told you, and you've internalized it because you've empathized with them. Yes, yes. There's another thing I'd like to touch on about Hyben, which is especially in the towpath workshops, we'd often get a, a sort of a haiku that was too big for the haiku. It's like trying to put, you know. Uh, somebody in high school in the coat that they wore in um, elementary school. And the person, the poet says, well, I wanted to say this. I, I want to say this. You know, if you ask the poet, what are you trying to say in this haiku? We, I remember one that um, uh, one of the Topath poets wanted to write about an abuse case where the, the children were of, uh, died of neglect. It was in Washington, D.C., and the neighbors didn't, they noticed that they were gone, but they didn't call the police, or the police came and they didn't, they took the mother's word for it. I mean, there was so much going on, you know, there's social workers were involved, and this is all supposed to happen in three lines. <laughs> so I said, and somebody else said, you know, I think this would be better as a high bun, and you could get more of the story in and then have the haiku evoke that sense of loss, you know, and she did publish, uh, she worked very hard on it. And I never, I never, you know, so, saw it again in Towpath, but I came across it in some publication. And it's one of my favorite high bun because it's very effective and it, and you do get that sense of helpless, helplessness for those two young girls. And it was a very horrific story, but that the the gritty details the horrible details are not in the high bun it's all by nuance and suggestion and the titles also works to do that just everything finally came together so i i do sometimes tell people who ask my advice about a, a particular haiku they're struggling with why don't you try writing a high bun and so they'll say well like this person said i've never written one before <laughs> and well, that shouldn't stop you, you know, you've read enough of them or you, they're there to read. I will advise people, please, please, please read High Bun before you start writing High Bun. Do not try to write them without reading them. And I can, I can usually tell from that modern haiku submissions who hasn't bothered to read even 
the the journal modern haiku you know for either the haiku or the or the hyphen or or the essays or any part of it it and, happens to me all the time and at failed haiku uh, and brian's experienced the same thing people send but me yours and yours is very accessible so they don't, they don't even have the excuse like sometimes they'll say oh i can't afford to buy an issue you know but you can see the sample poems of at modern haiku online and sample haibun well, I turn down poems that have been in modern haiku because I do take previously published work. I, I don't accept them. And the reason 90% of the time is not that I think Paul Miller got it wrong or, 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 or Charlie, or I, it's because it's a haiku. I'm a Senru journal. You didn't read <laughs> the right. journal to figure it out. I noticed that when I was guest editing, yeah. how many people, I mean, there can be a gray area where it could be read as a haiku or read as a senru, but there are some that there's no gray area. <laughs> it's an outright haiku and there's no human element, right. human emotion, nothing involved. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when I was guest editing, I did try once in a while to work with those people if yeah. I thought the prose was good, but if they didn't get it after, you know, as you know, since you're the editor, so, a co-editor now, so many submissions come in. Yeah. And you can't, um, you, you, can't you want to give people some guidance, but you can't just accept it because they submitted it. You know, well, the other thing is people have a voice. And I so because I didn't live your life, I can't I can't judge whether and I don't even care whether it's true or not true or whatever. But, but the but the whole story as a totality from the, the title to the poem and certainly the poem's prose, which I think is is a prose poem. Right. And there are plenty of <clears throat> prose poem journals out there. Yeah. Um, one thing, just a particular little preference of mine, I don't know if this happens to you, Mike, you're probably nicer about it than I am, if it does, is that people and sometimes friends of mine will send me work and say, could you look this over and basically edit it? And then I'm going to submit it to Modern Haiku. <laughs> that Doesn't is work. a no, no. Yeah, you can't. I will, you know, if somebody, if I've previously seen it somewhere else, like in a workshop and you've asked me previously for edits and you're going to submit it elsewhere, you know, that's okay, but I, you know, editors have to be very careful. We have to be like, uh, as this is where my law background comes in handy, avoid the, even the appearance of impropriety. So it's almost worse when it's somebody I know well, you know, I would prefer if it were a stranger, but having to turn that kind of thing down, you put the editor, in a very uncomfortable position by doing that. And I would suggest people do not do that. Yeah. And, and I would, uh, I have a hard time. Sometimes uh, I don't correct grammatical errors, uh, in, particularly in Hyben, because it's your language. And people, particularly if it's their, if English is their second or third language, uh, I'm not, I want their voice to come out. That's the way they would talk if they were sitting in a room with me and they would use those words. There are things you now that you live in Ireland. Uh, there's things in in Ireland that people say to each other that we wouldn't say to each other in America, and vice versa. Right. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't bring up the troubles in Northern Ireland if I was in Ireland. I'd let it. I'd leave it alone. You know, it's like it, so. There's yes, some good move. <laughs> yeah. It's. There, there are just some things that the way people deal with it. And so I like the, the, the people to have a voice and you do too. I mean, I look at the selections you make and there's, there, it, if I can overuse the word, it's an eclectic mix. I mean, there, there are the topics and the styles <laughs> are not the same. And you can write- that, a, that, big, that, that does bring up another thing I want to mention, which is, Modern haiku, I think, allows you to send in three high bun mm -hmm. and other journals, you know, usually have limits as well. 
my advice when doing that, if you have three, I rarely have three of my own to send any place. I mean, if I have two, it's, it's, it's quite a feat. I usually just have one. Is if you're going to write three, please don't write three of the same kind of high bun. In other words, I've gotten them where everything's been of a biblical theme with a quote from the Bible, let's say. Our, or each one has had lengthy footnotes. That's another thing that really turns me off is where you have to go outside the poem to understand it. Um, or they'll all be um, a crastic haiku, haibun, you know, about a painting, a piece of art. So you have three opportunities to grab the editor's attention. Um, don't make them all childhood reminiscences told from the same point of view. You know, mix it up, make one stream of consciousness, make one, you know, short sentences, make one long sentences, uh, make one interspersed with haiku, make one just monoku, make one with just one haiku. You know, so many choices that are open to you as, as the writer, and you have so many opportunities with that, with that number of submissions, you know, where they say submit, you can submit three or whatever the number is. So, to me, when the writer does not do that, when it's all three of the same, if I'm gonna not like it in the first one, I'm not gonna like it in the second or the third. And to me, that's like you've, you've, you had an opportunity and you've kind of squandered it, you know? I mean, and sometimes if people ask comments, I'll say that I will comment with that, although I, I'm putting it out here so that you know it gets to a wider audience because it does increase your chances of acceptance. The more variety and style that you put in your submissions, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know about other editors. Just speaking for myself, I'm I'm that way. I want to see I want to see all the things <clears throat> that you that you're trying. I want to see. I, that's why I ask for people to send me experimental things. Fine, I, it might not work in in a more more traditional journals. And I may not write that way myself. I may not ever do it my that way for me. But I can love it when somebody else tries it. Yeah. And it, and I, it works. I, I think you took one of mine recently that everything was told backwards, like the it started with somebody dying or something, and then it went backwards to childhood. Yeah, nope. and I love that you took that one. And um, you know, there are all sorts of opportunities for experimentation and hive and that's one of the great things about it and it and it's kind of when you see sort of run of the mill things that could be in any you know personal journal that a person keeps and that in other words like a descript a di diary today I did this 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 and this and it was raining and this happened and this happened and then I saw a flower and here's my haiku about the rose stuck in the wall or something. I mean, that's, you know, it's a very competitive field now, Haibun. They're teaching it in MFA programs. Right. It's, it's kind of, if it would be, you know, Twitter speak, it's trending. Yeah. So I do get uh, quite, it's, it's very competitive. If, if, you're, if you're selected by modern haiku for a Haibun, that, you know, you, that, that to me is like a pretty big deal. You should be proud of that. And uh, because it is, it is very quite hard to get in. Yeah, and, well, and I, I think people need to people need to understand that too. Yeah. That that uh, the value of Hyven may be some so, some of mine have never been anywhere because they're too close to me. And I think that's a that's another value of poetry, not just Hyven but haiku. There's some things that are just mine, and maybe they're publishable and maybe they're not but I don't share them with everybody. Well, maybe somebody will find them in the trunk after you're no longer here, like what happened with Emily Dickinson. And then in, uh, you know, a hundred years, it'll be the standard college text and they'll have necklaces with your haiku on them and bracelets, little, you know, Mike Relling stamps like they do for Emily Dickinson. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so I, I wish that I wish that haiku poets actually made it into the consciousness of the U.S. Post Office or anybody else. We we're sort of in this little group where we hide in a corner, and people misunderstand us. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, that's why I think I think it's it's incumbent upon us to send our work 
and also be risk taking in where we send it. I mean, uh, Rattle Rattle Magazine. That's I. Th I don't know. It's like harder to get in there. I think than to get into Harvard. I think I'm not that great at, at those statistics, but it's pretty damn hard to get in. Um, and you know, this year Alexis Rotella won oh. a. Um, she was a finalist with a high bun. Um, a, a beautiful high bun and uh it's an issue 70 if anybody gets the magazine or i think you can also find it online or you will be able to find it online soon and he also did a um an interview with her for uh recently tim green i'm talking about he's you know he's he's very open to high bun you won't find many that many in rattle but you'll find some and it, it is, you know, to, to just keep submitting to the same journals. I mean, yeah. people don't want to read the same people in, over and over. That's why at Modern Haiku, if you've been in one issue, I'm going to wait and, you know, at least wait one issue because it's, it's not, doesn't do anything for the form to keep just reading the same people. And, and, you know, there are undiscovered poets out there and yeah. modern haiku wants to discover them. But as far as, you know, Paul Miller also, uh, you know, for the haiku and, and uh, Hyben, there are a lot more people of all different ages writing them now and of all different backgrounds. And, you know, as long as you have a quality piece of work modern haiku is interested in seeing your high bun. So um, I hope people won't be put off by anything that I said, because I, for my own work, I, I send it to the so-called dream journals, which <laughs> is to me, I once said, somebody said to me, what's your definition of a dream journal? And I said, one that accepts my work actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because once that happens, I have had yeah. hundreds of poems published in weird places. Mary Grove College, which is now merged with U of D, uh, which was uh, the uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary uh, girls school in, uh, and they had their own uh, poetry journal and they published haiku and senru and, and I think a hyphen of mine. And, you know, I put it in these weird places that nobody expects to see uh haiku and uh, hundreds of times i mean they they accept them strangely enough and sometimes they'll ask me they'll, you get the email back and they say uh what is this <laughs> yeah I, that happened to me once actually somebody once um published my introduction that i sent them and they left off the high button <laughs> but luckily it was an online journal so i went back and i said uh you, you know that wasn't the piece that was just my telling you yeah. i'm attaching this thing <laughs> it's funny if, but but that's part of the educational process and the guy that got me into that was charlie trumbull because he he was talking one day uh so at some haiku meeting about how mainstream poetry doesn't accept haiku it, it, it occurred to me that sometimes haiku poets don't accept mainstream journals. We 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 tend to that's all, true. Yeah, muster in our own world. So anyway, I, and Debbie Kolodzie's done a couple of things on that. I think she's even published stuff on where to send, you know, to the outside the the realm of the haiku haiku community, the global haiku community. I mean, it's all it's up to the individual poet. Uh, then. There are also people in that other world, that world of very, you know, well known and well published, and they want to get in to yeah. this far world. So it works both ways. Yeah, and I think I think well, what what we've done here at least is give, to give people a sense. But you're one of the more open people about uh, style and form in Hyben, and. Um, that's the one thing I really appreciated about you. And I use your work as examples because, and I'll show them, this is, this is her writing perfect grammar. And this is her totally stream of consciousness. And it's the same person. 
you know? Yes, it's the many faces of Eve. <laughs> and and that's, that's what poetry is. It's it's not the same thing every time. One of the, I'll, I'll end it with this because it's a, we could go on all day, but uh, <laughs> Carl Sandburg, uh, I love his poetry. And, but there's some of his poetry, poems I, I love, and some I don't understand, and some I don't like. But his last uh, volume was called Honey and Salt. And they're just beautiful, lyrical poems. There's not a single loser in that little short book. And I'm going to confess, I stole it from the Bentry High School Library. And when they sent my mom a bill, <laughs> I lied. I said, I returned it, mom. I returned it. Years later, my and mother. it's right, sitting right behind you on your shelf. <laughs> when I, yeah, he still is. Uh, the, my, uh, my, my mother being smart, she lived to be 96. She was brilliant and a writer herself. She, uh, Years later, she was cleaning out, you know, after I'd been married and gone, she was cleaning out my room or something, and she found the book. And I was uh -huh. forced, I was forced to confess it was sitting on a bookshelf in my in my old room and they were moving, and she sent it to me. As I still have it with a binding broken. I've read it so many times. Uh -huh. But that's those I think are the there's a hyphen there. There there's is a hyphen there, Mike. There's a hyphen in all of this. <laughs> but Roberta. <laughs> You are uh, astounding. I thank you very much for doing this because people struggle with it. And I think that if they realize that you've succeeded at it and you've become an editor uh, at Modern Haiku and you still go through the same things that they all go through, I think that's sort of yes. inspirational. I really Thanks, appreciate Mike. it. So, <clears throat> I'm going to end on that note. Do you have anything else you want to say about it? Uh, as we say in our 12-step meetings, take what you like and leave the rest behind from what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you again, Roberta. I'm going to turn okay. off the recording right now. Okay.